This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by R. Francis Smith. Sturgeon's Law, www.sturgeonslaw.com. The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 4 the shoulder of athos the baldric of porthos and the handkerchief of aramis d'artagnan in his state of fury crossed the antechamber at three bounds and was darting towards the stairs which he reckoned upon descending four at a time when in his heedless course he ran head foremost against a musketeer who was coming out of one of monsieur de treville's private rooms and striking his shoulder violently made him utter a cry or rather a howl excuse me said d'artagnan endeavoring to resume his course excuse me but i am in a hurry scarcely had he descended the first stair when a hand of iron seized him by the belt and stopped him you are in a hurry said the musketeer as pale as a sheet under that pretense you run against me you say excuse me and you believe that is sufficient not at all my young man do you fancy because you have heard monsieur de treville speak to us a little cavalierly to-day that other people are to treat us as he speaks to us undeceive yourself comrade you are not monsieur de treville my faith replied d'artagnan recognizing athos who after the dressing performed by the doctor was returning to his own apartment i did not do it intentionally and not doing it intentionally i said excuse me it appears to me that this is quite enough i repeat to you however and this time on my word of honor i think perhaps too often that i am in haste great haste leave your hold then i beg of you and let me go where my business calls me monsieur said athos letting him go you are not polite it is easy to perceive that you come from a distance d'artagnan had already strode down three or four stairs but at athos's last remark he stopped short more blue monsieur said he however far i may come it is not you who can give me a lesson in good manners i warn you perhaps said athos ah if i were not in such haste and if i were not running after some one said d'artagnan monsieur man in a hurry you can find me without running me you understand and where i pray you near the calm de shore at what hour about noon about noon that will do i will be there endeavor not to make me wait for a quarter past twelve i will cut off your ears as you run good cried d'artagnan i will be there ten minutes before twelve and he set off running as if the devil possessed him hoping that he might yet find the stranger whose slow pace could not have carried him far but at the street gate porthos was talking with a soldier on guard between the two talkers there was just enough room for a man to pass d'artagnan thought it would suffice for him and he sprang forward like a dart between them but d'artagnan had reckoned without the wind as he was about to pass the wind blew out porthos's long cloak and d'artagnan rushed straight into the middle of it without doubt porthos had reasons for not abandoning this part of his vestments for instead of quitting his hold on the flap in his hand he pulled it toward him so that d'artagnan rolled himself up in the velvet by a movement of rotation explained by the persistency of porthos d'artagnan hearing the musketeer swear wished to escape from the cloak which blinded him and sought to find his way from under the folds of it he was particularly anxious to avoid marring the freshness of the magnificent baldric we are acquainted with but on timidly opening his eyes he found himself with his nose fixed between the two shoulders of porthos that is to say exactly upon the baldric alas like most things in this world which have nothing in their favor but appearances the baldric was glittering with gold in the front but was nothing but simple buff behind vainglorious as he was porthos could not afford to have a baldric wholly of gold but had at least half one could comprehend the necessity of the cold and the urgency of the cloak bless me cried porthos making strong efforts to disembarrass himself of d'artagnan who was wriggling about his back you must be mad to run against people in this manner excuse me said d'artagnan reappearing under the shoulder of the giant but i am in such haste i was running after some one and 
"'And do you always forget your eyes when you run?' asked Porthos. "'No,' replied D'Artagnan, piqued. "'And thanks to my eyes, I can see what other people cannot see.' Whether Porthos understood him, or did not understand him, giving way to his anger, Monsieur, said he, you stand a chance of getting chastised if you rub musketeers in this fashion. Chastise, Monsieur, said D'Artagnan, the expression is strong. It is one that becomes a man accustomed to look his enemies in the face. Ah, oh, pardieu! I know full well that you don't turn your back to yours and the young man, delighted with his joke, went away laughing loudly. Porthos foamed with rage, and made a movement to rush after D'Artagnan. "'Presently, presently,' cried the latter, "'when you haven't your cloak on.' "'At what o'clock, then, behind the Luxembourg?' "'Very well, at what o'clock, then,' replied D'Artagnan, turning the angle of the street. But neither in the street he had passed through, nor in the one which his eager glance pervaded, could he see any one. However slowly the stranger had walked, he was gone on his way, or perhaps had entered some house. D'Artagnan inquired of every one he met with, went down to the ferry, came up again by the Rue de Seine and the Red Cross, but nothing, absolutely nothing. This chase was, however, advantageous to him in one sense, for in proportion as the perspiration broke from his forehead, his heart began to cool he began to reflect upon the events that had passed they were numerous and inauspicious it was scarcely eleven o'clock in the morning and yet this morning had already brought him into disgrace with monsieur de treville who could not fail to think the manner in which d'artagnan had left him a little cavalier besides this he had drawn upon himself two good duels with two men each capable of killing three d'artagnans with two musketeers, in short, with two of those beings whom he esteemed so greatly that he placed them in his mind and heart above all other men. The outlook was sad. Sure of being killed by Athos, it may easily be understood that the young man was not very uneasy about Porthos. As hope, however, is the last thing extinguished in the heart of man, he finished by hoping that he might survive, even though with terrible wounds, in both these duels, and in case of surviving, he made the following reprehensions upon his own conduct. "'What a madcap I was, and what a stupid fellow I am! That brave and unfortunate Athos was wounded on that very shoulder against which I must run head foremost like a ram. The only thing that astonishes me is that he did not strike me dead at once.' He had good cause to do so. The pain I gave him must have been atrocious. As to Porthos, oh, as to Porthos, faith, that's a droll affair. And in spite of himself, the young man began to laugh aloud, looking round carefully, however, to see that his solitary laugh, without a cause in the eyes of passers-by, offended no one. As to Porthos, that is certainly droll, but I am not the less a giddy fool. Are people to be run against without warning? No. And have I any right to go and peep under their cloaks to see what is not there? He would have pardoned me, he would certainly have pardoned me, if I had not said anything to him about that cursed baldric. In ambiguous words, it is true, but rather drolly ambiguous. A cursed Gascon that I am, I get from one hobble into another. Friend D'Artagnan, continued he, speaking to himself with all the amenity that he thought due himself, if you escape, of which there is not much chance, I would advise you to practice perfect politeness for the future. You must henceforth be admired and quoted as a model of it. To be obliging and polite does not necessarily make a man a coward. Look at Aramis now. Aramis is mildness and grace personified. Well, did anybody ever dream of calling Aramis a coward? No, certainly not, and from this moment I will endeavor to model myself after him. Oh, that's strange. Here he is. D'Artagnan, walking and soliloquizing, had arrived within a few steps of the Hotel d'Arguillon, and in front of that hotel perceived Aramis, chatting gaily with three gentlemen. But as he had not forgotten that it was in the presence of this young man that Monsieur de Treville had been so angry in the morning, and as a witness of the rebuke the musketeers had received was not likely to be at all agreeable, he pretended not to see him. D'Artagnan, on the contrary, quite full of his plans of conciliation and courtesy, approached the young men with a profound bow, accompanied by a most gracious smile. 
All four, besides, immediately broke off their conversation. D'Artagnan was not so dull as not to perceive that he was one too many, but he was not sufficiently broken into the fashions of the gay world to know how to extricate himself gallantly from a false position, like that of a man who begins to mingle with people he is scarcely acquainted with, and in a conversation that does not concern him. He was seeking in his mind, then, for the least awkward means of retreat, when he remarked that Aramis had let his handkerchief fall, and by mistake, no doubt, had placed his foot upon it. This appeared to be a favorable opportunity to repair his intrusion. He stooped, and with the most gracious air he could assume, drew the handkerchief from under the foot of the musketeer, in spite of the efforts the latter made to detain it, and holding it out to him said, I believe, monsieur, that this is a handkerchief you would be sorry to lose. The handkerchief was indeed richly embroidered, and had a coronet and arms at one of its corners. Aramis blushed excessively, and snatched rather than took the handkerchief from the hand of the Gascon. "'Ha, ha!' cried one of the guards. "'Will you persist in saying, most discreet Aramis, that you are not on good terms with Madame de Beautrecy, when that gracious lady has the kindness to lend you one of her handkerchiefs?' Aramis darted at D'Artagnan one of those looks which inform a man that he has acquired a mortal enemy. Then resuming his mild air, "'You are deceived, gentlemen,' said he. "'This handkerchief is not mine, and I cannot fancy why Monsieur has taken it into his head to offer it to me rather than to one of you. And as a proof of what I say, here is mine in my pocket.' So saying, he pulled out his own handkerchief, likewise a very elegant handkerchief, and of fine cambric, though cambric was dear at the period, but a handkerchief without embroidery and without arms, only ornamented with a single cipher, that of its proprietor. This time D'Artagnan was not hasty. He perceived his mistake, but the friends of Aramis were not at all convinced by his denial, and one of them addressed the young musketeer with affected seriousness. "'If it were as you pretend it is,' said he, "'I should be forced, my dear Aramis, to reclaim it myself, "'for, as you very well know, Boitracy is an intimate friend of mine, "'and I cannot allow the property of his wife to be sported as a trophy.' "'You make the demand badly,' replied Aramis, "'and while acknowledging the justice of your reclamation, "'I refuse it on account of the form.' The fact is, hazarded D'Artagnan timidly, I did not see the handkerchief fall from the pocket of Monsieur Aramis. He had his foot upon it, that is all, and I thought from having his foot upon it the handkerchief was his. And you were deceived, my dear sir, replied Aramis coldly, very little sensible to the reparation. Then turning toward that one of the guards who had declared himself the friend of Tracy, Besides, continued he, I have reflected, my dear intimate of Boitracy, that I am not less tenderly his friend than you can possibly be, so that decidedly this handkerchief is as likely to have fallen from your pocket as mine. No, upon my honor, cried his majesty's guardsman. You are about to swear upon your honor, and I upon my word, and then it will be pretty evident that one of us will have lied. Now here, Monteran, we will do better than that. Let each take a half. Of the handkerchief? Yes. Perfectly just, cried the other two guardsmen. The judgment of King Solomon. Aramis, you certainly are full of wisdom. The young men burst into a laugh, and, as may be supposed, the affair had no other sequel. In a moment or two the conversation ceased, and the three guardsmen and the musketeer, after having cordially shaken hands, separated, the guardsmen going one way, and Aramis another. "'Now is my time to make peace with this gallant man,' said D'Artagnan to himself, having stood on one side during the whole of the latter part of the conversation. And with this good feeling drawing near to Aramis, who was departing without paying any attention to him, "'Monsieur,' said he, "'you will excuse me, I hope.' "'Ah, monsieur,' interrupted Aramis, "'permit me to observe to you that you have not acted in this affair as a gallant man ought.' "'What, monsieur?' cried D'Artagnan. "'And do you suppose—' "'I suppose, monsieur, that you are not a fool, "'and that you know very well, although coming from Gascony, "'that people do not tread upon handkerchiefs without a reason. "'What the devil! Paris is not paved with cambric!' 
monsieur you act wrongly in endeavouring to mortify me said d'artagnan in whom the natural quarrelsome spirit began to speak more loudly than his pacific resolutions i am from gascony it is true and since you know it there is no occasion to tell you that gascons are not very patient so that when they have begged to be excused once were it even for a folly they are convinced that they have done already at least as much again as they ought to have done monsieur what i say to you about the matter said aramis is not for the sake of seeking a quarrel thank god i am not a bravo and being a musketeer but for a time i only fight when i am forced to do so and always with great repugnance but this time the affair is serious for here is a lady compromised by you by us you mean cried d'artagnan why did you so maladroitly restore me the handkerchief why did you so awkwardly let it fall i have said monsieur and i repeat that the handkerchief did not fall from my pocket and thereby you have lied twice monsieur for i saw it fall ah you take it with that tone do you master gascon well i will teach you how to behave yourself and i will send you back to your mass book master abbe draw if you please and instantly not so if you please my good friend not here at least do you not perceive that we are opposite the hotel d'arguillon which is full of the cardinal's creatures how do i know that this is not his eminence who has honoured you with a commission to procure my head now i entertain a ridiculous partiality for my head it seems to suit my shoulders so correctly i wish to kill you be at rest as to that but to kill you quietly in a snug remote place where you will not be able to boast of your death to anybody i agree monsieur but do not be too confident take your handkerchief whether it belongs to you or another you may perhaps stand in need of it monsieur is a gascon asked aramis yes monsieur does not postpone an interview through prudence prudence monsieur is a virtue sufficiently useless to musketeers i know but indispensable to churchmen and as i am only a musketeer provisionally i hold it good to be prudent at two o'clock i shall have the honour of expecting you at the hotel of monsieur de treville there i will indicate to you the best place and time the two young men bowed and separated aramis ascending the street which led to the luxembourg while d'artagnan perceiving the appointed hour was approaching took the road to the con de Chaux, saying to himself decidedly i can't draw back but at least if i am killed I shall be killed by a musketeer. End of chapter 4《Recording》All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by R. Francis Smith Sturgeon's Law, www.sturgeonslaw.com The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas Chapter Five: The King's Musketeers and the Cardinal's Guards D'Artagnan was acquainted with nobody in Paris. He went, therefore, to his appointment with Athos without a second, determined to be satisfied with those his adversary should choose. Besides, his intention was formed to make the brave musketeer all suitable apologies, but without meanness or weakness, fearing that might result from this duel, which generally results from an affair of this kind, when a young and vigorous man fights with an adversary who is wounded and weakened. If conquered, he doubles the triumph of his antagonist. If a conqueror, he is accused of foul play and want of courage." now we must have badly painted the character of our adventure-seeker or our readers must have already perceived that d'artagnan was not an ordinary man therefore while repeating to himself that his death was inevitable he did not make up his mind to die quietly as one less courageous and less restrained might have done in his place he reflected upon the different characters of men he had to fight with and began to view his situation more clearly he hoped by means of loyal excuses to make a friend of athos whose lordly air and austere bearing pleased him much 
he flattered himself he should be able to frighten porthos with the adventure of the baldric which he might if not killed upon the spot relate to everybody a recital which well managed would cover porthos with ridicule as to the astute aramis he did not entertain much dread of him and supposing he should be able to get so far he determined to dispatch him in good style or at least by hitting him in the face as caesar recommended his soldiers do to those of pompey to damage forever the beauty of which he was so proud in addition to this d'artagnan possessed that invincible stock of resolution which the counsels of his father had implanted in his heart endure nothing from any one but the king the cardinal and monsieur de treville he flew then rather than walked toward the convent of the carme de chausse or rather de show as it was called at that period a sort of building without a window surrounded by barren fields an accessory to the proclic and which was generally employed as a place for the duels of men who had no time to lose when d'artagnan arrived in sight of the bare spot of ground which extended along the foot of the monastery athos had been waiting about five minutes and twelve o'clock was striking he was then as punctual as the samaritan woman and the most rigorous casuist with regard to duels could have nothing to say athos who still suffered grievously from his wound though it had been dressed anew by monsieur de treville's surgeon was seated on a post and waiting for his adversary with hat in hand his feather even touching the ground monsieur said athos i have engaged two of my friends as seconds but these two friends are not yet come at which i am astonished as it is not at all their custom i have no seconds on my part monsieur said d'artagnan for having only arrived yesterday in paris i yet know no one but monsieur de treville to whom i was recommended by my father who has the honor to be in some degree one of his friends athos reflected for an instant you know no one but monsieur de treville he asked yes monsieur i know only him well but then continued athos speaking half to himself if i kill you i shall have the air of a boy slayer not too much so replied d'artagnan with a bow that was not deficient in dignity since you do me the honor to draw a sword with me while suffering from a wound which is very inconvenient very inconvenient upon my word and you hurt me devilishly i can tell you but i will take the left hand it is my custom in such circumstances do not fancy that i do you a favor i use either hand easily and it will be even a disadvantage to you a left-handed man is very troublesome to people who are not prepared for it i regret i did not inform you sooner of this circumstance you have truly monsieur said d'artagnan bowing again a courtesy for which i assure you i am very grateful you confuse me replied athos with his gentlemanly air let us talk of something else if you please ah s'blood how you have hurt me my shoulder quite burns if you would permit me said d'artagnan with timidity what monsieur i have a miraculous balsam for wounds a balsam given to me by my mother and of which i have made a trial upon myself well well i am sure that in less than three days this balsam would cure you and at the end of three days when you would be cured well sir it would still do me a great honor to be your man d'artagnan spoke these words with a simplicity that did honor to his courtesy without throwing the least doubt upon his courage pardieu monsieur said athos that's a proposition that pleases me not that i can accept it but a league off it savors of the gentleman thus spoke and acted the gallant knights of the time of charlemagne in whom every cavalier ought to seek his model unfortunately we do not live in the times of the great emperor we live in the times of the cardinal and three days hence however well the secret might be guarded it would be known i say that we were to fight and our combat would be prevented i think these fellows will never come if you are in haste monsieur said d'artagnan with the same simplicity with which a moment before he had proposed to him to put off the duel for three days and if it be your will to dispatch me at once do not inconvenience yourself i pray you there is another word which pleases me cried athos with a gracious nod to d'artagnan that did not come from a man without heart monsieur i love men of your kidney 
and I foresee plainly that, if we don't kill each other, I shall hereafter have much pleasure in your conversation. We will wait for these gentlemen, so please you. I have plenty of time, and it will be more correct. Ah, here is one of them, I believe. In fact, at the end of the Rue Valgerard, the gigantic Porthos appeared. What, cried D'Artagnan, is your first witness, Monsieur Porthos? Yes, that disturbs you. By no means. And here is the second. D'Artagnan turned in the direction pointed to by Athos, and perceived Aramis. What, cried he, in an accent of greater astonishment than before, your second witness is Monsieur Aramis? Doubtless. Are you not aware that we are never seen one without the others, and that we are called among the musketeers and the guards, at court and in the city, Athos, Porthos, and Aramis, or the three inseparables? And yet, as you come from Dart or Port, from Tarbes, said D'Artagnan, it is probable you are ignorant of this little fact, said Athos. "'My faith,' replied D'Artagnan, "'you are well named, gentlemen, "'and my adventure, if it should make any noise, "'will prove at least that your union "'is not founded upon contrasts.' "'In the meantime, Porthos had come up, "'waved his hand to Athos, "'and then turning toward D'Artagnan, "'stood quite astonished. "'Let us say in passing that he had changed his baldric "'and relinquished his cloak. "'Ah, ah,' said he, "'what does this mean?' "'This is the gentleman I am going to fight with,' said Athos, pointing to D'Artagnan with his hand, and saluting him with the same gesture. "'Why, it was with him I am also going to fight,' said Porthos. "'But not before one o'clock,' replied D'Artagnan. "'And I also am to fight with this gentleman,' said Aramis, coming in his turn on to the place. "'But not until two o'clock,' said D'Artagnan, with the same calmness. "'But what are you going to fight about, Athos?' asked Aramis. "'Faith, I don't very well know. "'He hurt my shoulder, and you, Porthos?' "'Faith, I am going to fight, because I am going to fight,' answered Porthos, reddening. Athos, whose keen eye lost nothing, perceived a faintly sly smile pass over the lips of the young Gascon as he replied, "'We had a short discussion upon dress.' "'And you, Aramis?' asked Athos. "'Oh, ours is a theological quarrel,' replied Aramis, making a sign to D'Artagnan to keep secret the cause of their duel. Athos, indeed, saw a second smile upon the lips of D'Artagnan. "'Indeed,' said Athos. "'Yes, a passage of St. Augustine, upon which we could not agree,' said the Gascon. "'Decidedly, this is a clever fellow,' murmured Athos. "'And now you are assembled, gentlemen,' said D'Artagnan. "'Permit me to offer you my apologies.' At this word, apologies, a cloud passed over the brow of Athos, a haughty smile curled the lip of Porthos, and a negative sign was the reply of Aramis. "'You do not understand me, gentlemen,' said D'Artagnan, throwing up his head, the sharp and bold lines of which were at the moment gilded by a bright ray of the sun. "'I ask to be excused in case I should not be able to discharge my debt to all three. For Monsieur Athos has the right to kill me first which must much diminish the face value of your bill, Monsieur Porthos, and render yours almost null, Monsieur Aramis. And now, gentlemen, I repeat, excuse me, but on that account only, and a god. At these words, with the most gallant air possible, D'Artagnan drew his sword. The blood had mounted to the head of D'Artagnan, and at that moment he would have drawn his sword against all the musketeers in the kingdom as willingly as he now did against Athos, Porthos, and Aramis. It was a quarter past midday. The sun was in its zenith, and the spot chosen for the scene of the duel was exposed to its full ardor. "'It is very hot,' said Athos, drawing his sword in its turn, "'and yet I cannot take off my doublet.' for I just now felt my wound begin to bleed again, and I should not like to annoy Monsieur with a sight of blood which he has not drawn from me himself. "'That is true, Monsieur,' replied D'Artagnan, "'and whether drawn by myself or another, I assure you I shall always view with regret the blood of so brave a gentleman. I will therefore fight in my doublet like yourself.' "'Come, come, enough of such compliments,' cried Porthos. "'Remember, we are waiting for our turns.' "'Speak for yourself when you are inclined to utter such incongruities,' interrupted Aramis. "'For my part, I think what they say is very well said, and quite worthy of two gentlemen.' "'When you please, monsieur,' said Athos, putting himself on guard. "'I waited your orders,' said D'Artagnan, crossing swords. 
But scarcely had the two rapiers clashed when a company of the guards of his eminence, commanded by Monsieur de Jussac, turned the corner of the convent. "'The cardinal's guards!' cried Aramis and Porthos at the same time. "'Sheathe your swords, gentlemen! Sheathe your swords!' But it was too late. The two combatants had been seen in a position which left no doubt of their intentions. Hello! cried Jussac, advancing toward them and making a sign to his men to do so likewise. Hello, musketeers! Fighting here, are you? And the edicts! What has become of them? You are very generous, gentlemen of the guards, said Athos, full of rancor, for Jussac was one of the aggressors of the preceding day. If we were to see you fighting, I can assure you that we would make no effort to prevent you. Leave us alone, then, and you will enjoy a little amusement without cost to yourselves. Gentlemen, said Jussac, it is with great regret that I pronounce the thing impossible. Duty before everything. Sheathe, then, if you please, and follow us. Monsieur, said Aramis, parodying Jussac, it would afford us great pleasure to obey your polite invitation if it depended upon ourselves. But unfortunately the thing is impossible. Monsieur de Treville has forbidden it. Pass on your way, then. It is the best thing to do. This raillery exasperated Jussac. "'We will charge upon you, then,' said he, "'if you disobey.' "'There are five of them,' said Athos, half aloud, "'and we are but three. "'We shall be beaten again, and must die on the spot, "'for on my part I declare I will never appear again "'before the captain as a conquered man.' Athos, Porthos, and Aramis instantly drew near one another, while Jussac drew up his soldiers. This short interval was sufficient to determine D'Artagnan on the part he was to take. It was one of those events which decide the life of a man. It was a choice between the king and the cardinal. The choice made, it must be persisted in. To fight, that was to disobey the law. That was to risk his head. That was to make it one blow an enemy of a minister more powerful than the king himself. All this young man perceived, and yet, to his praise we speak it, he did not hesitate a second. Turning toward Athos and his friends, "'Gentlemen,' said he, "'allow me to correct your words, if you please. You said you were but three, but it appears to me we are four. "'But you are not one of us,' said Porthos. "'That's true,' replied D'Artagnan. "'I have not the uniform, but I have the spirit.' "'My heart is that of a musketeer. "'I feel it, monsieur, and that impels me on.' "'Withdraw, young man,' cried Jussac, "'who doubtless, by his gestures and the expression of his countenance, "'had guessed D'Artagnan's design. "'You may retire. We consent to that. "'Save your skin. Be gone quickly.' "'D'Artagnan did not budge. "'Decidedly, you are a brave fellow,' said Athos, "'pressing the young man's hand. "'Come, come, choose your part,' replied Jussac. Well, said Porthos to Aramis, we must do something. Monsieur is full of generosity, said Athos. But all three reflected upon the youth of D'Artagnan, and dreaded his inexperience. We should only be three, one of whom is wounded, with the addition of a boy, resumed Athos. And yet, it will not be the less said, we were four men. Yes, but to yield, said Porthos. That is difficult, replied Athos. D'Artagnan comprehended their irresolution. "'Try me, gentlemen,' said he, "'and I swear to you, by my honor, "'that I will not go hence if we are conquered.' "'What is your name, my brave fellow?' said Athos. "'D'Artagnan, monsieur.' "'Well, then, Athos, Porthos, Aramis, and D'Artagnan, "'forward!' cried Athos. "'Come, gentlemen, have you decided?' "'cried Jussac for the third time. "'It is done, gentlemen,' said Athos. "'And what is your choice?' asked Jussac. "'We are about to have the honor of charging you,' replied Aramis, lifting his hat with one hand and drawing his sword with the other. "'Ah, you resist, do you?' cried Jussac. "'Sblood, does that astonish you?' And the nine combatants rushed upon each other with a fury which, however, did not exclude a certain degree of method. Athos fixed upon a certain Cahusac, a favorite of the cardinals. Porthos had Bicarat, and Aramis found himself opposed to two adversaries— as to d'artagnan he sprang toward jussac himself the heart of the young gascon beat as if it would burst through his side not from fear god he thanked he had not the shade of it but with emulation 
He fought like a furious tiger, turning ten times round his adversary, and changing his ground and his guard twenty times. Juzac was, as was then said, a fine blade, and had had much practice. Nevertheless, it required all his skills to defend himself against an adversary who, active and energetic, departed every instant from received rules, attacking him on all sides at once, and yet parrying like a man who had the greatest respect for his own epidermis. This contest at length exhausted Juzac's patience. Furious at being held in check by one whom he had considered a boy, he became warm and began to make mistakes. D'Artagnan, who, though wanting in practice, had a sound theory, redoubled his agility. Juzac, anxious to put an end to this, springing forward, aimed a terrible thrust at his adversary, but the latter parried it, and while Juzac was recovering himself, glided like a serpent beneath his blade, and passed his sword through his body. Juzac fell like a dead mass. D'Artagnan then cast an anxious and rapid glance over the field of battle. Aramis had killed one of his adversaries, but the other pressed him warmly. Nevertheless, Aramis was in a good situation, and able to defend himself. Bicarat and Porthos had just made counter-hits. Porthos had received a thrust through his arm, and Bicarat one through his thigh. But neither of these two wounds was serious, and they only fought more earnestly. Athos, wounded anew by Cahusac, became evidently paler, but did not give way a foot. He only changed his sword hand and fought with his left hand. According to the laws of dueling at that period, D'Artagnan was at liberty to assist whom he pleased. While he was endeavoring to find out which of his companions stood in greatest need, he caught a glance from Athos. The glance was of sublime eloquence. Athos would have died rather than appeal for help, but he could look, and with that look ask assistance. D'Artagnan interpreted it with a terrible bound he sprang to the side of Cahusac, crying to me, Monsieur Guardsman, I will slay you. Cahusac turned. It was time, for Athos, whose great courage alone supported him, sank upon his knee. Splud, cried he to D'Artagnan, do not kill him, young man, I beg of you. I have an old affair to settle with him when I am cured and sound again. Disarm him only, make sure of his sword. That's it, very well done. The exclamation was drawn from Athos by seeing the sword of Cahusac fly twenty paces from him. D'Artagnan and Cahusac sprang forward at the same instant, the one to recover, the other to obtain the sword. But D'Artagnan, being the more active, reached it first and placed his foot upon it. Cahusac immediately ran to the guardsman whom Aramis had killed, seized his rapier, and returned toward D'Artagnan. But on his way he met Athos, who during his relief, which D'Artagnan had procured him, had recovered his breath, and who, for fear that D'Artagnan would kill his enemy, wished to resume the fight. D'Artagnan perceived that it would be disobliging Athos not to leave him alone, and in a few minutes Cahusac fell with a sword thrust through his throat. At the same instant Aramis placed his sword-point on the breast of his fallen enemy and forced him to ask for mercy. There only then remained Porthos and Bicarat. Porthos made a thousand flourishes, asking Bicarat what o'clock it could be, and offering him compliments upon his brothers having just obtained a company in the regiment of Navarre. But just as he might, he gained nothing. Bicarat was one of those iron men who never fell dead. Nevertheless, it was necessary to finish. The watch might come up and take all the combatants, wounded or not, royalists or cardinalists. Athos, Aramis, and D'Artagnan surrounded Bicarat and required him to surrender. Though alone against all, and with a wound in his thigh, Bicarat wished to hold out, but Juzac, who had risen upon his elbow, cried out to him to yield. Bicarat was a Gascon, as D'Artagnan was. He turned a deaf ear, and contented himself with laughing, and between two parries finding time to point to a spot of earth with his sword. Here, cried he, parodying a verse of the Bible, here will Bicarat die, for I only am left, and they seek my life. But there are four against you. Leave off, I command you. Ah, if you command me, that's another thing, said Bicarat. As you are my commander, it is my duty to obey. And springing backward, he broke his sword across his knee to avoid the necessity of surrendering it, threw the pieces over the convent wall, and crossed his arms, whistling a cardinalist air. Bravery is always respected, even in an enemy. The musketeers saluted Bicarat with their swords, and returned them to their sheaths. D'Artagnan did the same. Then, assisted by Bicarat, the only one left standing, 
he bore Juzak Cahusac and one of Aramis's adversaries, who was only wounded under the porch of the convent. The fourth, as we have said, was dead. They then rang the bell, and carrying away four swords out of five, they took their road, intoxicated with joy, toward the hotel of Monsieur de Treville. They walked arm in arm, occupying the whole width of the street, and taking in every musketeer they met, so that in the end it became a triumphal march. The heart of D'Artagnan swam in delirium. He marched between Athos and Porthos, pressing them tenderly. "'If I am not yet a musketeer,' said he to his new friends, as he passed through the gateway of Monsieur de Treville's hotel, "'at least I have entered upon my apprenticeship, haven't I?' End of chapter 5「A LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Shanda Williams, Atlanta, Georgia, April 2006. The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 6. His Majesty King Louis the Thirteenth. This affair made a great noise. Monsieur de Treville scolded his musketeers in public, and congratulated them in private. But as no time was to be lost in gaining the king, Monsieur de Treville hastened to report himself at the Louvre. It was already too late. The king was closeted with the cardinal, and Monsieur de Treville was informed that the king was busy, and could not receive him at that moment. In the evening, Monsieur de Treville attended the king's gaming table. The king was winning, and as he was very avaricious, he was in an excellent humor. Perceiving Monsieur de Treville at a distance, "'Come here, Monsieur Captain,' he said. "'Come here, that I may growl at you. Do you know that his eminence has been making fresh complaints against your musketeers, and that with so much emotion after this evening his eminence is indisposed?' Ah, these musketeers of yours are very devils, fellows to be hanged. No, sire, replied Treville, who saw at the first glance how things would go. On the contrary, they are good creatures, as meek as lambs, and have but one desire. I'll be their warranty, and that is that their swords may never leave their scabbards but in your majesty's service. But what are they to do? The guards of Monsieur the Cardinal are for ever seeking quarrels with them, and for the honor of the corps even, the poor young men are obliged to defend themselves. Listen to Monsieur de Treville, said the king, listen to him. Would not one say he was speaking of a religious community? In truth, my dear captain, I have a great mind to take away your commission and give it to Mademoiselle de Chamarreau, to whom I promised an abbey. But don't fancy that I am going to take you on your bare word. I am called Louis the Just, Monsieur de Treville, and by and by, by and by, we will see. Ah, sire, it is because I confide in that justice that I shall wait patiently and quietly the good pleasure of your majesty. Wait, then, Monsieur, wait, said the king. I will not detain you long. In fact, fortune changed, and as the king began to lose what he had won, he was not sorry to find an excuse for playing Charlemagne, if we may use a gaming phrase of whose origin we confess our ignorance. The king therefore arose a minute after, and putting the money which lay before him into his pocket, the major part of which arose from his winnings, La Vouéville, said he, take my place. I must speak to Monsieur de Treville on an affair of importance. Ah, I had eighty louis before me. Put down the same sum, so that they who have lost may have nothing to complain of. Justice before everything. Then turning toward Monsieur de Treville, and walking with him toward the embrasure of a window. Well, Monsieur, continued he, you say it is his eminence's guard to have sought a quarrel with your musketeers? Yes, sire, as they always do. And how did the thing happen? Let us see, for you know, my dear captain, a judge must hear both sides. Good Lord, in the most simple and natural manner possible, three of my best soldiers, whom your majesty knows by name, and whose devotedness you have more than once appreciated, and who have, I dare affirm to the king, his service much at heart, 
three of my best soldiers, I say, Athos, Porthos, and Aramis, had made a party of pleasure with a young fellow from Gascony, whom I had introduced to them the same morning. The party was to take place at St. Germain, I believe, and they had appointed to meet at the Carme des Chaux, where they were disturbed by de Jusac, Cahuzac, and Bicara, and two other guardsmen, who certainly did not go there in such a numerous company without some ill intention against the edicts. Ah, ah, you incline me to think so, said the king. There is no doubt they went thither to fight themselves. I do not accuse them, sire, but I leave your majesty to judge what five armed men could possibly be going to do in such a deserted place as the neighborhood of the convent des Carmes. Yes, you are right, Treville, you are right. Then, upon seeing my musketeers, they changed their minds, and forgot their private hatred for partisan hatred, for your majesty could not be ignorant that the musketeers, who belong to the king, and nobody but the king, are the natural enemies of the guardsmen, who belong to the cardinal. Yes, Treville, yes, said the king in a melancholy tone. And it is very sad, believe me, to see thus two parties in France, two heads to royalty. But all this will come to an end, Treville, will come to an end. You say, then, that the guardsmen sought a quarrel with the musketeers? I say that it is probable that things have fallen out so, but I will not swear to it, sire. You know how difficult it is to discover the truth, and unless a man be endowed with that admirable instinct which causes Louis the Thirteenth to be named the just— you are right, Treville, but they were not alone, your musketeers. They had a youth with them? Yes, sire, and one wounded man, so that three of the king's musketeers, one of whom was wounded, and a youth, not only maintained their ground against five of the most terrible of the cardinal's guardsmen, but absolutely brought four of them to earth. Why, this is a victory, cried the king, all radiant, a complete victory. Yes, sire, as complete as that as the bridge of Say. Four men, one of them wounded, and a youth, say you? One hardly a young man, but who, however, behaved himself so admirably on this occasion that I will take the liberty of recommending him to your majesty. How does he call himself? D'Artagnan, sire. He is the son of one of my oldest friends, the son of a man who served under the king your father of glorious memory in the Civil War. And you say this young man behaved himself well? Tell me how, Treville, you know how I delight in accounts of war and fighting. And Louis the Thirteenth twisted his moustache proudly, placing his hand upon his hip. Sire, resumed Treville, as I told you, Monsieur d'Artagnan is a little more than a boy, and he has not the honor of being a musketeer. He was dressed as a citizen. The guards of the cardinal, perceiving his youth and that he did not belong to the corps, invited him to retire before they attacked. So you may plainly see, Treville, interrupted the king. It was they who attacked? That is true, sire. There can be no more doubt on that head. They called upon him then to retire, but he answered that he was a musketeer at heart, entirely devoted to your majesty, and that therefore he would remain with Monsieur's the musketeers. Brave young man, murmured the king. Well, he did remain with them, and your majesty has in him so firm a champion that it was he who gave Jusac the terrible sword-thrust which has made the cardinal so angry. He who wounded Jusac, cried the king, he a boy? Treville, that is impossible. It is as I have the honor to relate it to your majesty. Jusac, one of the first swordsmen in the kingdom? Well, sire, for once he found his master. I will see this young man, Treville. I will see him, and if anything can be done, well, we will make it our business. When will your majesty deign to receive him? Tomorrow at midday, Treville. Shall I bring him alone? No, bring me all four together. I wish to thank them all at once. Devoted men are so rare, Treville. By the back of the staircase, it is useless to let the cardinal know. Yes, sire. You understand, Treville, an edict is still an edict. It is forbidden to fight, after all. But this encounter, sire, is quite out of the ordinary conditions of a duel. It is a brawl, and the proof is that there were five of the cardinal's guardsmen against my three musketeers and Monsieur d'Artagnan. That is true, said the king, but never mind, Treville. Come still by the back staircase. Treville smiled. 
but as it was indeed something to have prevailed upon this child to rebel against his master he saluted the king respectfully and with this agreement took leave of him that evening the three musketeers were informed of the honor accorded them as they had long been acquainted with the king they were not much excited but d'artagnan with his gascon imagination saw in it his future fortune and passed the night in golden dreams by eight o'clock in the morning he was at the apartment of athos d'artagnan found the musketeer dressed and ready to go out as the hour to wait upon the king was not till twelve he had made a party with porthos and aramis to play a game at tennis in a tennis court situated near the stables of luxembourg athos invited d'artagnan to follow them and although ignorant of the game which he had never played he accepted not knowing what to do at this time from nine o'clock in the morning as it then scarcely was till twelve the two musketeers were already there and were playing together athos who was very expert in all bodily exercises passed with d'artagnan to the opposite side and challenged them but at the first effort he made although he played with his left hand he found that his wound was yet too recent to allow of such exertion d'artagnan remained therefore alone and as he declared he was too ignorant of the game to play it regularly they only continued giving balls to one another without counting but one of these balls launched by porthos's herculean hand passed so close to d'artagnan's face that he thought if instead of passing near it had hit him his audience would have been probably lost as it would have been impossible for him to present himself before the king now as upon this audience in his gascon imagination depended his future life he saluted aramis and porthos politely declaring that he would not resume the game until he should be prepared to play with them on more equal terms and went and took his place near the court and in the gallery unfortunately for d'artagnan among the spectators was one of his eminence's guardsmen who still irritated by the defeat of his companions which had happened only the day before had promised himself to seize the first opportunity of avenging it he believed this opportunity was now come and addressed his neighbor it is not astonishing that a young man should be afraid of a ball for he is doubtless a musketeer apprentice d'artagnan turned round as if a serpent had stung him and fixed his eyes intensely upon the guardsman who had just made this insolent speech pardieu resumed the latter twisting his moustache look at me as long as you like my little gentleman i have said what i have said and as since that which you have said is too clear to require an explanation replied d'artagnan in a low voice i beg you to follow me and when asked the guardsman with the same jeering air at once if you please and you know who i am without doubt i i'm completely ignorant nor does it much disquiet me you're in the wrong there for if you knew my name perhaps you would not be so pressing what is your name bernajot at your service well then monsieur bernajot said d'artagnan tranquilly i will wait for you at the door go monsieur i will follow you do not hurry yourself monsieur lest it be observed that we go out together you must be aware that for our undertaking company would be in the way that's true said the guardsman astonished that his name had not produced more effect upon the young man indeed the name of bernajot was known to all the world d'artagnan alone excepted perhaps for it was one of those of which figured most frequently in the daily brawls which all the edicts of the cardinal could not repress porthos and aramis were so engaged with their game and athos was watching them with so much attention that they did not even perceive their young companion go out who as he had told the guardsman of his eminence stopped outside the door an instant after the guardsman descended in his turn as d'artagnan had no time to lose on account of the audience of the king which was fixed for midday he cast his eyes around and seeing that the street was empty said to his adversary my faith it is fortunate for you although your name is bernajot to have only to deal with an apprentice musketeer never mind be content i will do my best on guard but said he whom d'artagnan thus provoked it appears to me that this place is badly chosen and that we should be better behind the abbey st germain or in the pre aux clairs what you say is full of sense replied d'artagnan but unfortunately i have very little time to spare having an appointment at precisely twelve on guard then monsieur on guard 
Bernajot was not a man to have such a compliment paid to him twice. In an instant his sword glittered in his hand, and he sprang upon his adversary, whom, thanks to his great youthfulness, he hoped to intimidate. But D'Artagnan had, on the preceding day, served his apprenticeship. Fresh sharpened by his victory, full of hopes of future favor, he was resolved not to recoil a step. So the two swords were crossed close to the hilts, and as D'Artagnan stood firm, it was his adversary who made the retreating step. But D'Artagnan seized the moment at which, in this movement, the sword of Bernajot deviated from the line. He freed his weapon, made a lunge, and touched his adversary on the shoulder. D'Artagnan immediately made a step backward and raised his sword, but Bernajot cried out that it was nothing, and rushing blindly upon him, absolutely spitted himself upon D'Artagnan's sword. As, however, he did not fall, as he did not declare himself conquered, but only broke away toward the hotel of Monsieur de la Tremouille, in whose service he had a relative, D'Artagnan was ignorant of the seriousness of the last wound his adversary had received, and pressing him warmly, without doubt, would soon have completed his work with a third blow, when the noise which arose from the street being heard in the tennis court, two of the friends of the guardsman who had seen him go out after exchanging some words with D'Artagnan, rushed sword in hand from the court, and fell upon the conqueror. But Athos, Porthos, and Aramis quickly appeared in their turn, and the moment the two guardsmen attacked their young companion, drove them back. Bernajot now fell, and as the guardsmen were only two against four, they began to cry, "'To the rescue! The Hôtel de la Tremouille!' At these cries all who were in the hotel rushed out, and fell upon the four companions, who, on their side, cried aloud, "'To the rescue, musketeers!' This cry was generally heeded, for the musketeers were known to be enemies of the cardinal, and were beloved on account of the hatred they bore to his eminence. Thus the soldiers of other companies than those which belonged to the Red Duke, as Aramis had called him, often took part with the king's musketeers in these quarrels. Of three guardsmen of the company of Monsieur Dessessart, who were passing, two came to the assistance of the four companions, while the other ran toward the hotel of Monsieur de Treville, crying, "'To the rescue, musketeers, to the rescue!' As usual, the hotel was full of soldiers of this company, who hastened to the succor of their comrades. The melee became general, but strength was on the side of the musketeers. The cardinal's guards and Monsieur de la Tremouille's people retreated into the hotel, the doors of which they closed just in time to prevent their enemies from entering with them. As to the wounded man, he had been taken in at once, and, as we have said, in a very bad state." Excitement was at its height among the musketeers and their allies, and they even began to deliberate whether they should not set fire to the hotel to punish the insolence of Monsieur de la Tremouille's domestics in daring to make a sortie upon the king's musketeers. The proposition had been made and received with enthusiasm, when fortunately eleven o'clock struck. D'Artagnan and his companions remembered their audience, and as they would very much have regretted that such an opportunity should be lost, they succeeded in calming their friends, who contented themselves with hurling some paving-stones against the gates. But the gates were too strong. They soon tired of the sport. Besides, those who must be considered the leaders of the enterprise had quit the group, and were making their way toward the hotel of Monsieur de Treville, who was waiting for them, already informed of this fresh disturbance. "'Quick to the Louvre,' said he, "'to the Louvre without losing an instant, "'and let us endeavor to see the king "'before he is prejudiced by the cardinal. "'We will describe the thing to him "'as a consequence of the affair of yesterday, "'and the two will pass off together.' Monsieur de Treville, accompanied by the four young fellows, directed his course toward the Louvre, but to the great astonishment of the captain of the musketeers, he was informed that the king had gone stag-hunting in the forest of St. Germain. Monsieur de Treville required this intelligence to be repeated to him twice, and each time his companion saw his brow become darker. "'Had his majesty,' asked he, "'any intention of holding this hunting party yesterday?' "'No, Your Excellency,' replied the valet de chambre. "'The master of the hounds came this morning to inform him that he had marked down a stag. At first the king answered that he would not go, but he could not resist his love of sport, and set out after dinner. "'And the king has seen the cardinal?' asked Monsieur de Treville. "'In all probability he has,' replied the valet, "'for I saw the horses harnessed to his eminence's carriage this morning, "'and when I asked where he was going, they told me, to St. Germain.' 
"'He is beforehand with us,' said Monsieur de Treville. "'Gentlemen, I will see the king this evening, but as to you, I do not advise you to risk doing so.' This advice was too reasonable, and moreover came from a man who knew the king too well, to allow the four young men to dispute it. Monsieur de Treville recommended every one to return home and wait for news. On entering his hotel, Monsieur de Treville thought it best to be first in making the complaint. He sent one of his servants to Monsieur de la Tremouille with a letter in which he begged of him to eject the cardinal's guardsmen from his house, and to reprimand his people for their audacity in making sortie against the king's musketeers. But Monsieur de la Tremouille, already prejudiced by his esquire, whose relative, as we already know, Bernajot was, replied that it was neither for Monsieur de Treville nor the musketeers to complain but on the contrary for him, whose people the musketeers had assaulted, and whose hotel they had endeavoured to burn. Now, as the debate between these two nobles might last a long time, each becoming, naturally, more firm in his own opinion, Monsieur de Treville thought of an expedient which might terminate it quietly. This was to go himself to Monsieur de la Tremouille. He repaired, therefore, immediately to his hotel, and caused himself to be announced. The two nobles saluted each other politely, for if no friendship existed between them there was at least esteem. Both were men of courage and honour, and as Monsieur de la Tremouille, a Protestant, and seeing the king seldom, was of no party, he did not, in general, carry any bias into his social relations. This time, however, his address, although polite, was cooler than usual. Monsieur said Monsieur de Treville, we fancy that we have each cause to complain of the other, and I am come to endeavour to clear up this affair. I have no objection, replied Monsieur de la Tremouille, but I warn you that I am well informed, and all the fault is with your musketeers. You are too just and reasonable a man, Monsieur, said Treville, not to accept the proposal I am about to make to you. Make it, Monsieur, I listen. How is Monsieur Bernajot, your esquire's relative? Why, Monsieur, very ill indeed. In addition to the sword thrust in his arm, which is not dangerous, he has received another right through his lungs, of which the doctor says bad things. But the wounded man retained his senses? Perfectly. Does he talk? With difficulty, but he can speak. Well, Monsieur, let us go to him. Let us adjure him, in the name of the God before whom he must perhaps appear, to speak the truth. I will take him for judge in his own cause, Monsieur, and will believe what he will say. Monsieur de la Tremouille reflected for an instant. Then, as it was difficult to suggest a more reasonable proposal, he agreed to it. Both descended to the chamber in which the wounded man lay. The latter, on seeing these two noble lords who came to visit him, endeavoured to raise himself up in his bed, but he was too weak and exhausted by the effort. He fell back again almost senseless. Monsieur de la Tremouille approached him and made him inhale some salts which recalled him to life. Then Monsieur de Treville, unwilling that it should be thought that he had influenced the wounded man, requested Monsieur de la Tremouille to interrogate him himself. That happened which Monsieur de Treville had foreseen. Placed between life and death as Bernajot was, he had no idea for a moment of concealing the truth, and he described to the two nobles the affair exactly as it had passed. This was all that Monsieur de Treville wanted. He wished Bernajot a speedy convalescence, took leave of Monsieur de la Tremouille, returned to his hotel, and immediately sent word to the four friends that he awaited their company at dinner. Monsieur de Treville entertained good company, wholly anti-cardinalist, though. It may be easily understood, therefore, that the conversation during the whole of dinner turned upon the two checks that his eminence as guardsman had received. Now, as D'Artagnan had been the hero of these two fights, it was upon him that all felicitations fell, which Athos, Porthos, and Aramis abandoned to him, not only as good comrades, but as men who had so often had their turn that they could very well afford him his. Toward six o'clock Monsieur de Treville announced that it was time to go to the Louvre, but as the hour of the audience granted by His Majesty was past, instead of claiming the entry by the back stairs, he placed himself with the four young men in the antechamber. The king had not yet returned from hunting. Our young men had been waiting about half an hour amid a crowd of courtiers, when all the doors were thrown open and His Majesty was announced. 
At his announcement, D'Artagnan felt himself tremble to the very marrow of his bones. The coming instant would in all probability decide the rest of his life. His eyes, therefore, were fixed in a sort of agony upon the door through which the king must enter. Louis the Thirteenth appeared walking fast. He was in hunting costume, covered with dust, wearing large boots, and holding a whip in his hand. At the first glance, D'Artagnan judged that the mind of the king was stormy. This disposition, visible as it was in his majesty, did not prevent the courtiers from ranging themselves along his pathway. In royal antechambers, it is worth more to be viewed with an angry eye than not to be seen at all. The three musketeers, therefore, did not hesitate to make a step forward. D'Artagnan, on the contrary, remained concealed behind them, but although the king knew Athos, Porthos, and Aramis personally, he passed before them without speaking, or looking, indeed, as if he had ever seen them before. As for Monsieur de Treville, when the eyes of the king fell upon him, he sustained the look with so much firmness that it was the king who dropped his eyes, after which his majesty, grumbling, entered his apartment matters go but badly said athos smiling and we shall not be made chevaliers of the order this time wait here ten minutes said monsieur de treville and if at the expiration of ten minutes you do not see me come out return to my hotel for it will be useless for you to wait for me longer the four young men waited ten minutes a quarter of an hour twenty minutes and seeing that monsieur de treville did not return went away very uneasy as to what was going to happen Monsieur de Treville entered the king's cabinet boldly, and found his majesty in a very ill humor, seated on an armchair, beating his boot with the handle of his whip. This, however, did not prevent his asking, with the greatest coolness, after his majesty's health. "'Bad, Monsieur, bad,' replied the king, "'I am bored.' This was, in fact, the worst complaint of Louis the Thirteenth, who would sometimes take one of his courtiers to a window and say, Monsieur so-and-so, let us weary ourselves together. How, your majesty is bored? Have you not enjoyed the pleasures of the chase to-day? A fine pleasure, indeed, Monsieur. Upon my soul, everything degenerates, and I don't know whether it is the game which leaves no scent, or the dogs that have no noses. We started a stag of ten branches, we chased him for six hours, and when he was near being taken, when St. Simon was already putting his horn to his mouth to sound the mort, crack, all the pack takes the wrong scent and sets off after a two-year-older. I shall be obliged to give up hunting, as I have given up hawking. Ah, I am an unfortunate king, Monsieur de Treville. I had but one gerfalcon, and he died day before yesterday. Indeed, sire, I wholly comprehend your disappointment. The misfortune is great, but I think you still have a good number of falcons, sparrow-hawks, and tear-sets. And not a man to instruct them. Falconers are declining. I know no one but myself who is acquainted with the noble art of venery. After me it will all be over, and people will hunt with gins, snares, and traps. If I had but the time to train pupils! But there is the cardinal, always at hand, who does not leave me a moment's repose, who talks to me about Spain, who talks to me about Austria, who talks to me about England. Ah! A propos of the cardinal, Monsieur de Treville, I am vexed with you. This was the chance at which Monsieur de Treville waited for the king. He knew the king of old, and he knew that all these complaints were but a preface, a sort of excitation to encourage himself, and that he had now come to his point at last. "'And in what have I been so unfortunate as to displease your majesty?' asked Monsieur de Treville, feigning the most profound astonishment. "'Is it thus you perform your charge, Monsieur?' continued the king, without directly replying to de Treville's question. Is it for this I name you captain of my musketeers, that they should assassinate a man, disturb a whole quarter, and endeavor to set fire to Paris without your saying a word? But yet, continued the king, undoubtedly my haste accuses you wrongfully. Without doubt the rioters are in prison, and you come to tell me justice is done. Sire, replied Monsieur de Treville calmly, on the contrary, I come to demand it of you. "'And against whom?' cried the king. "'Against calumniators,' said Monsieur de Treville. "'Ah, this is something new,' replied the king. 
"'May you tell me that your three damned musketeers, Athos, Porthos, and Aramis, and your youngster from Bern, have not fallen, like so many furies, upon poor Bernajot, and have not maltreated him in such a fashion, that probably by this time he is dead? Will you tell me that they did not lay siege to the hotel of Duc de la Tremouille, and that they did not endeavor to burn it, which would not, perhaps, have been a great misfortune in time of war, seeing that it is nothing but a nest of Huguenots, but which is, in time of peace, a frightful example. Tell me now, can you deny all this? And who told you this fine story, sire? asked Treville quietly. Who has told me this fine story, monsieur? Who should it be but he who watches while I sleep, who labors while I amuse myself, who conducts everything at home and abroad, in France as in Europe? "'Your Majesty probably refers to God,' said Monsieur de Treville, "'for I know no one except God who can be so far above your Majesty.' "'No, Monsieur, I speak of the prop of the State, of my only servant, of my only friend, of the Cardinal. "'His eminence is not His Holiness, sire.' "'What do you mean by that, Monsieur?' "'That it is only the Pope who is infallible, and that this infallibility does not extend to Cardinals.' "'You mean to say that he deceives me? "'You mean to say that he betrays me? "'You accuse him, then. "'Come, speak, avow freely that you accuse him.' "'No, sire, but I say that he deceives himself. "'I say that he is ill-informed. "'I say that he has hastily accused your majesty's musketeers, "'toward whom he is unjust, "'and that he has not obtained his information from good sources. "'The accusation comes from Monsieur de la Tremouille, "'from the duke himself.' what do you say to that i might answer sire that he is too deeply interested in the question to be a very impartial witness but so far from that sire i know the duke to be a royal gentleman and i refer the matter to him but upon one condition sire what it is that your majesty will make him come here will interrogate him yourself tete a tete without witnesses and that i shall see your majesty as soon as you have seen the duke "'What, then? You will bind yourself,' cried the king, "'by what Monsieur de la Tremouille shall say. "'Yes, sire. You will accept his judgment? "'Undoubtedly. "'And you will submit to the reparation he may require? "'Certainly.' "'La Chesnay,' said the king, "'la Chesnay. "'Louis the Thirteenth's confidential valet, "'who never left the door, entered in reply to the call. "'La Chesnay,' said the king, "'let some one go instantly and find Monsieur de la Tremouille. "'I wish to speak with him this evening. "'Your Majesty gives me your word "'that you will not see any one "'between Monsieur de la Tremouille and myself, "'nobody, by the faith of a gentleman. "'Tomorrow, then, sire. "'Tomorrow, Monsieur. "'At what o'clock, please, Your Majesty? "'At any hour you will.' "'but in coming too early I should be afraid of awakening your majesty. "'Awaken me! Do you think I ever sleep, then? "'I sleep no longer, monsieur. I sometimes dream, that's all. "'Come, then, as early as you like, at seven o'clock. "'But beware if you and your musketeers are guilty. "'If my musketeers are guilty, sire, "'the guilty shall be placed in your majesty's hands. "'Who will dispose of them at your good pleasure? "'Does your majesty require anything further? "'Speak, I am ready to obey.' "'No, monsieur, no. I am not called Louis the Just without reason. "'Tomorrow, then, monsieur, to-morrow. "'Till then, God preserve your majesty.' "'However ill the king might sleep, monsieur de Treville slept still worse. "'He had ordered his three musketeers and their companion "'to be with him at half-past six in the morning. "'He took them with him without encouraging them or promising them anything, "'and without concealing from them that their luck, and even his own, "'depended upon the cast of the dice.' Arrived at the front of the back stairs, he desired them to wait. If the king was still irritated against them, they would depart without being seen. If the king consented to see them, they would only have to be called. On arriving at the king's private antechamber, Monsieur de Treville found La Chesnay, who informed him that they had not been able to find Monsieur de la Tremouille on the preceding evening at his hotel, that he returned too late to present himself at the Louvre, that he had only that moment arrived, and that he was at that very hour with the king. This circumstance pleased Monsieur de Treville much, as he thus became certain that no foreign suggestion could insinuate itself between Monsieur de la Tremouille's testimony and himself. In fact, ten minutes had scarcely passed away when the door of the king's closet opened, and Monsieur de Treville saw Monsieur de la Tremouille come out. The duke came straight up to him and said, 
monsieur de treville his majesty has just sent for me in order to inquire respecting the circumstances which took place yesterday at my hotel i have told him the truth that is to say that the fault lay with my people and that i was ready to offer you my excuses since i have the good fortune to meet you i beg you to receive them and to hold me always as one of your friends monsieur the duke said monsieur de treville i was so confident of your loyalty that i required no other defender before his majesty than yourself i find that i have not been mistaken and i thank you that there is still one man in france of whom may be said without disappointment what i have said of you that's well said cried the king who had heard all these compliments through the open door only tell him treville since he wishes to be considered your friend that i also wish to be one of his but he neglects me that it is nearly three years since i have seen him and that i never do see him unless i send for him tell him all this for me for these are things which a king cannot say for himself thanks sire thanks said the duke but your majesty may be assured that it is not those i do not speak of monsieur de treville whom your majesty sees at all hours of the day that are most devoted to you ah you have heard what i said so much the better duke so much the better said the king advancing toward the door ah it is you treville where are your musketeers i told you the day before yesterday to bring them with you why have you not done so they are below sire and with your permission la chesnay will bid them come up yes yes let them come up immediately it is nearly eight o'clock and at nine i expect a visit go monsieur duke and return often come in treville the duke saluted and retired at the moment he opened the door the three musketeers and d'artagnan conducted by la chesnay appeared at the top of the staircase come in my braves said the king come in i am going to scold you the musketeers advanced bowing d'artagnan following closely behind them what the devil continued the king seven of his eminence's guards placed hors de combat by you four in two days that's too many gentlemen too many if you go on so his eminence will be forced to renew his company in three weeks and i to put the edicts in force in all their rigour one now and then i don't say too much about but seven in two days i repeat it is too many it is far too many therefore sire your majesty sees that they are come quite contrite and repentant to offer you their excuses quite contrite and repentant hm said the king i place no confidence in their hypocritical faces in particular there is one yonder of a gascon look come hither monsieur d'artagnan who understood that it was to him this compliment was addressed approached assuming a most deprecating air why you told me he was a young man this is a boy treville a mere boy do you mean to say that it was he who bestowed that severe thrust at jussac and those two equally fine thrusts at bernajot truly without reckoning said athos that if he had not rescued me from the hands of cahusac i should not now have the honor of making my very humble reverence to your majesty why he is a very devil this bernai vente saint gris monsieur de treville as the king my father would have said but at this sort of work many doublets must be slashed and many swords broken now gascons are always poor are they not sire i can assert that they have hitherto discovered no gold mines in their mountains though the lord owes them this miracle and recompense for the manner in which they supported the pretensions of the king your father which is to say that the gascons made a king of me myself seeing that i am my father's son is it not treville well happily i don't say nay to it la chesnay go and see if by rummaging all my pockets you can find forty pistoles and if you can find them bring them to me and now let us see young man with your hand upon your conscience how did all this come to pass d'artagnan related the adventure of the preceding day in all its details how not having been able to sleep for the joy he felt in the expectation of seeing his majesty he had gone to his three friends three hours before the hour of audience how they had gone together to the tennis court and how upon the fear he had manifested lest he receive a ball in the face he had been jeered at by bernajot who had nearly paid for his jeer with his life and monsieur de la tremouille who had nothing to do with the matter with the loss of his hotel this is all very well murmured the king yes this is just the account the duke gave me of the affair poor cardinal seven men in two days and those of his very best but that's quite enough gentlemen please to understand that's enough 
You have taken your revenge for the Rue Ferro, and even exceeded it. You ought to be satisfied. If your majesty is so, said Treville, we are. Oh, yes, I am, added the king, taking a handful of gold from La Chesnay, and putting it into the hand of D'Artagnan. Here, said he, is a proof of my satisfaction. At this epoch the ideas of pride which are in fashion in our days did not prevail. A gentleman received from hand to hand money from the king, and was not the least in the world humiliated. D'Artagnan put his forty pistoles into his pocket without any scruple, on the contrary thanking his majesty greatly. There, said the king, looking at a clock, there now, as it is half-past eight you may retire, for as I told you I expect some one at nine. Thanks for your devotedness, gentlemen. I may continue to rely upon it, may I not? Oh, sire, cried the four companions with one voice, we would allow ourselves to be cut to pieces in your majesty's service. Well, well, but keep whole, that will be better, and you will be as more useful to me. Treville, added the king in a low voice, as the others were retiring, as you have no room in the musketeers, and as we have besides decided that a novitiate is necessary before entering that corps, place this young man in the company of the guards of Monsieur Dessessart, your brother-in-law. Ah, pardieu, Treville, I enjoy beforehand the face of the cardinal will make. He will be furious, but I don't care. I am doing what is right." The king waved his hand to Treville, who left him and rejoined the musketeers, whom he found sharing the forty pistoles with D'Artagnan. The cardinal, as his majesty had said, was really furious, so furious that during eight days he absented himself from the king's gaming table. This did not prevent the king from being as complacent to him as possible whenever he met him, or from asking in the kindest tone, "'Well, Monsieur Cardinal, how fair is it with the poor Jusac and that poor Bernajou of yours?' End of chapter 6
but had never heard him laugh. His words were brief and expressive, conveying all that was meant and no more. No embellishments, no embroidery, no arabesques. His conversation, a matter of fact, without a single romance. Although Athos was scarcely thirty years old, and was of great personal beauty and intelligence of mind, no one knew whether he had ever had a mistress. He had never spoken of women. He certainly did not prevent others from speaking of them before him, although it was easy to perceive that this kind of conversation, in which he only mingled by bitter words and misanthropic remarks, was very disagreeable to him. His reserve, his roughness, and his silence made almost an old man of him. He had, then, in order not to disturb his habits, accustomed Grimaud to obey him upon a simple gesture or upon a simple movement of his lips. He never spoke to him, except under the most extraordinary occasions. Sometimes Grimaud, who feared his master as he did fire, while entertaining a strong attachment to his person and a great veneration for his talents, believed he perfectly understood what he wanted, flew to execute the order received, and did precisely the contrary. Athos then shrugged his shoulders, and without putting himself in a passion, thrashed Grimaud. On these days he spoke a little. Porthos, as we have seen, had a character exactly opposite to that of Athos, he not only talked much, but he talked loudly, little caring, we must render him that justice, whether anybody listened to him or not. He talked for the pleasure of talking, and for the pleasure of hearing himself talk. He spoke upon all subjects except the sciences, alleging in this respect the inveterate hatred he had borne to scholars from his childhood. He had not so noble an air as Athos, and the commencement of their intimacy often rendered him unjust toward that gentleman, whom he endeavored to eclipse by his splendid dress. But with his simple musketeer's uniform, and nothing but the manner in which he threw back his head and advanced his foot, Athos instantly took the place which was his due and consigned the ostentatious Porthos to the second rank. Porthos consoled himself by filling the antechamber of Monsieur de Torville and the guard-room of the Louvre with the accounts of his love-scrapes, after having passed from professional ladies to military ladies, from the lawyer's dame to the baroness, there was question of nothing less with Porthos than a foreign princess, who was enormously fond of him. An old proverb says, Like master, like man let us pass then from the valet of athos to the valet of porthos from grimaud to mousqueton mousqueton was a norman whose specific name of boniface his master had changed into the infinitely more sonorous name of mousqueton he had entered the service of porthos upon condition that he should only be clothed and lodged though in a handsome manner but he claimed two hours a day to himself consecrated to an employment which would provide for his other wants. Porthos agreed to the bargain. The thing suited him wonderfully well. He had doublets, cut out of his old clothes, and cast off cloaks for Mousqueton, and thanks to a very intelligent tailor, who made his clothes look as good as new by turning them, and whose wife was suspected of wishing to make Porthos descend from his aristocratic habits, Mousqueton made a very good figure when attending on his master. As for Aramis, of whom we believe we have sufficiently explained the character, a character which, like that of his lackey, was called Bazin, thanks to the hopes which his master entertained of some day entering into orders, he was always clothed in black, as became the servant of a churchman. He was a Berichon, thirty-five or forty years old, mild, peaceable, sleek, employing the leisure his master left him in the perusal of pious works, providing rigorously for two a dinner of few dishes, but excellent. For the rest he was dumb, blind, and deaf, and of unimpeachable fidelity. And now that we are acquainted, superficially at least, with the masters and the valets, let us pass on to the dwellings occupied by each of them. Athos dwelt in the Rue Ferru, within two steps of the Luxembourg. 
his apartment consisted of two small chambers very nicely fitted up in a furnished house the hostess of which still young and still really handsome cast tender glances uselessly at him some fragments of past splendor appeared here and there upon the walls of this modest lodging a sword for example richly embossed which belonged by its make to the times of francis i the hilt of which alone encrusted with precious stones might be worth two hundred pistoles and which nevertheless in his moments of greatest distress athos had never pledged or offered for sale it had long been an object of ambition for porthos porthos would have given ten years of his life to possess this sword one day when he had an appointment with the duchess he endeavored even to borrow it of athos athos without saying anything emptied his pockets got together all his jewels purses aiguillettes and gold chains and offered them all to porthos but as to the sword he said it was sealed to its place and should never quit it until its master should call himself quit his lodgings in addition to the sword there was a portrait representing a nobleman of the time of henry the third dressed with the greatest elegance and who wore the order of the holy ghost and this portrait had certain resemblances of lines with athos certain family likenesses which indicated that this great noble a knight of the order of the king was his ancestor besides these a casket of magnificent gold work with the same arms as the sword and the portrait formed a middle ornament to the mantelpiece and assorted badly with the rest of the furniture athos always carried the key of this coffer about him but he one day opened it before porthos and porthos was convinced that this coffer contained nothing but letters and papers love letters and family papers no doubt porthos lived in an apartment large in size and of very sumptuous appearance in the rue du vieux colombier every time he passed with a friend before his windows at one of which mousqueton was sure to be placed in full livery porthos raised his head and his hand and said that is my abode but he was never to be found at home he never invited anybody to go up with him and no one could form an idea of what his sumptuous apartment contained in the shape of real riches as to aramis he dwelt in a little lodging composed of a boudoir an eating-room and a bedroom which room situated as the others were on the ground floor looked out upon a little fresh green garden shady and impenetrable to the eyes of his neighbors with regard to d'artagnan we know how he was lodged and we have already made acquaintance with his lackey master planchet d'artagnan who was by nature very curious as people generally are who possess the genius of intrigue did all he could to make out who athos porthos and aramis really were for under these pseudonyms each of these young men concealed his family name athos in particular who a league away savored of nobility he addressed himself then to porthos to gain information respecting athos and aramis and to aramis in order to learn something of porthos unfortunately porthos knew nothing of the life of his silent companion but what revealed itself it was said athos had met with great crosses in love and that a frightful treachery had forever poisoned the life of this gallant man what could this treachery be all the world was ignorant of it as to porthos except his real name as was the case with those of his two comrades his life was very easily known vain and indiscreet it was as easy to see through him as through a crystal the only thing to mislead the investigator would have been belief in all the good things he said of himself with respect to aramis though having the air of having nothing secret about him he was a young fellow made up of mysteries answering little to questions put to him about others and having learned from him the report which prevailed concerning the success of the musketeer with a princess wished to gain a little insight into the amorous adventures of his interlocutor and you my dear companion said he you speak of the baronesses countesses and princesses of others 
Pardieu, I spoke of them because Porthos talked of them himself, because he had paraded all these fine things before me. But be assured, my dear Monsieur d'Artagnan, that if I had obtained them from any other source, or if they had been confided to me, there exists no confessor more discreet than myself. Oh, I don't doubt that, replied d'Artagnan but it seems to me that you are terribly familiar with coats of arms a certain embroidered handkerchief for instance to which i owe the honor of your acquaintance this time aramis was not angry but assumed the most modest air and replied in a friendly tone my dear friend do not forget that i wish to belong to the church and that i avoid all mundane opportunities the handkerchief you saw had not been given to me, but it had been forgotten and left at my house by one of my friends. I was obliged to pick it up in order not to compromise him and the lady he loves. As for myself, I neither have nor desire to have a mistress, following in that respect the very judicious example of Athos, who has none any more than I have. But what the devil! You are not a priest. You are a musketeer. A musketeer for a time, my friend, as the cardinal says, a musketeer against my will, but a churchman at heart, believe me. Athos and Porthos dragged me into this to occupy me. I had, at the moment of being ordained, a little difficulty with, but, but that would not interest you, and I am taking up your valuable time. Oh, not at all. It interests me very much, cried D'Artagnan, and at this moment— I have absolutely nothing to do. Yes, but I have my breviary to repeat, answered Aramis. Then some verses to compose, which Madame d'Aguillon begged of me. Then I must go to Rue Saint-Honoré in order to purchase some rouge for Madame de Chevreuse. So you see, my dear friend, that if you are not in a hurry, I am very much in a hurry. Aramis held out his hand in a cordial manner to his young companion and took leave of him. Notwithstanding all the pains he took, D'Artagnan was unable to learn any more concerning his three new-made friends. He formed, therefore, the resolution of believing for the present all that was said of their past, hoping for more certain and extended revelations in the future. In the meanwhile he looked upon Athos as an Achilles, Porthos as an Ajax, and Aramis as a Joseph as to the rest the life of the four young friends was joyous enough athos played and that as a rule unfortunately nevertheless he never borrowed a sou of his companions although his purse was ever at their service and when he had played upon honor he always awakened his creditor by six o'clock the next morning to pay his debt of the preceding evening porthos had his fits on the days when he won he was insolent and ostentatious. If he lost, he disappeared completely for several days, after which he reappeared with a pale face and thinner person, but with money in his purse. As to Aramis, he never played. He was the worst musketeer and the most unconvivial companion imaginable. He had always something or other to do, sometimes in the midst of dinner, when everyone, under the attraction of wine and in the warmth of conversation, believed they had two or three hours longer to enjoy themselves at table. Aramis looked at his watch, arose with a bland smile, and took leave of the company to go, as he said, to consult a casuist with whom he had an appointment. At other times he would return home to write a treatise, and requested his friends not to disturb him. At this Athos would smile with his charming, melancholy smile, which so became his noble countenance, and Porthos would drink, swearing that Aramis would never be anything but a village cure. Planchet, d'Artagnan's valet, supported his good fortune nobly. He received thirty sous per day, and for a month he returned to his lodgings, gay as a chaffinch, and affable toward his master. When the wind of adversity began to blow upon the housekeeping of the Rue des Fossoyeurs, that is to say, when the forty pistoles of King Louis the Thirteenth were consumed, or nearly so, he commenced complaints which Athos thought nauseous, Porthos indecent, and Aramis ridiculous. 
Athos counseled D'Artagnan to dismiss the fellow. Porthos was of the opinion that he should give him a good thrashing first, and Aramis contended that a master should never attend to anything but the civilities paid to him. "'This is all very easy for you to say,' replied D'Artagnan, "'for you, Athos, who live like a dumb man with Grimaud, "'who forbid him to speak and consequently never exchange ill words with him, "'for you, Porthos, who carry matters in such a magnificent style "'and are a god to your valet, Mousqueton, "'and for you, Aramis, who always abstracted by your theological studies "'inspire your servant, Bazin, a mild, religious man with a profound respect.' but for me who am without any settled means and without resources for me who am neither a musketeer nor even a guardsman what am i to do to inspire either the affection the terror or the respect in planchet this is serious answered the three friends it is a family affair it is with valets as with wives they must be placed at once upon the footing in which you wish them to remain reflect upon it D'Artagnan did reflect, and resolved to thrash Planchet provisionally, which he did with the conscientiousness that D'Artagnan carried into everything. After having well beaten him, he forbade him to leave his service without his permission. For, added he, the future cannot fail to mend. I inevitably look for better times. Your fortune is therefore made if you remain with me, and I am too good a master to allow you to miss such a chance by granting you the dismissal you require. This manner of acting roused much respect for D'Artagnan's policy among the musketeers. Planchet, was equally seized with admiration, and said no more about going away. The life of the four young men had become fraternal. D'Artagnan, who had no settled habits of his own, as he came from his province, into the midst of his world quite new to him, fell easily into the habits of his friends. They rose about eight o'clock in the winter, about six in the summer, and went to take the countersign and see how things went on at Monsieur de Treville's. D'Artagnan, although he was not a musketeer, performed the duty of one with remarkable punctuality. He went on guard because he always kept company with whoever of his friends was on duty. He was well known at the hotel of the musketeers, where everyone considered him a good comrade. Monsieur de Treville, who had appreciated him at the first glance, and who bore him a real affection, never ceased recommending him to the king. On their side, the three musketeers were much attached to their young comrade. The friendship which united these four men, and the need they felt of seeing another three or four times a day, whether for dueling, business, or pleasure, caused them to be continually running after one another like shadows, and the inseparables were constantly to be met with seeking one another. From the Luxembourg to the Place Saint-Sulpice, or from the Rue de vieux Colombier to the Luxembourg. In the meanwhile, the promises of Monsieur de Treville went on prosperously. One fine morning the king commanded Monsieur de Chevalier d'Essersart to admit D'Artagnan as a cadet in his company of guards. D'Artagnan, with a sigh, donned his uniform, which he would have exchanged for that of a musketeer at the expense of ten years of his existence. But Monsieur de Treville promised this favor after a novitiate of two years, a novitiate which might besides be abridged if an opportunity should present itself for D'Artagnan to render the king any signal service or to distinguish himself by some brilliant action. Upon this promise D'Artagnan withdrew, and the next day he began his service. Then it became the turn of Athos, Porthos, and Aramis to mount guard with D'Artagnan when he was on duty. The company of Monsieur le Chevalier d'Essersart thus received four instead of one when it admitted D'Artagnan.